Good evening, bedtime stories lovers. Tonight, we dive into a classic tale of mystery and curse entitled The House of the Seven Gables, written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This story takes us to Salem, New England in the 17th century and explores an old house that holds dark secrets. Behind its sturdy stone walls, the House of the Seven Gables stands tall, bearing the traces of a dark history and a haunting curse. Built on the land of Matthew Moore, a man accused of witchcraft and hanged by Colonel Pynchon, this house becomes a symbol of revenge and tragedy. Colonel Pynchon, plagued by guilt for his role in Moore's death, built this magnificent house as a symbol of his wealth. However, Moore's curse looms over the Pynchon family like a shadow, leading them to tragedy and death. The mysterious death of Colonel Pynchon on the night of his housewarming marks the beginning of the curse taking its toll. Let's follow the journey of Hepzibah and Clifford Pynchon, two siblings burdened by their family's dark past. Hepzibah lives in solitude and bitterness, while Clifford is haunted by the guilt of a crime he never committed. However, a ray of hope emerges with the arrival of Phoebe Pynchon, a distant relative who brings joy and optimism to the old house. Phoebe, with her free and innocent spirit, sees the good in others and helps them heal the wounds of the past. Amidst the mystery and curse, this story also presents a complicated and challenging love story. Holgrave, a mysterious lodger, harbors secrets from his past that connect to the Pynchon family. His encounter with Phoebe sparks a love interest, yet their pasts become obstacles difficult to overcome. Ready to explore the corridors of time and unravel the secrets of the House of the Seven Gables, join this tale filled with adventure, love, and the search for meaning. Tonight, let's listen to the story of sin, curse, and redemption at the House of the Seven Gables. What are you waiting for? Let's begin. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this podcast so that more people can enjoy it. Thank you. Preface When a writer calls his work a romance, it need hardly be observed that he wishes to claim a certain latitude, both as to its fashion and material, which he would not have felt himself entitled to assume had he professed to be writing a novel. The latter form of composition is presumed to aim at a very minute fidelity, not merely to the possible, but to the probable and ordinary course of man's experience. The former, while as a work of art, it must rigidly subject itself to laws, and while it sins unpardonably so far as it may swerve aside from the truth of the human heart, has fairly a right to present that truth under circumstances to a great extent, of the writer's own choosing or creation. If he think fit also, he may so manage his atmospherical medium as to bring out or mellow the lights and deepen and enrich the shadows of the picture. He will be wise, no doubt, to make a very moderate use of the privileges here stated, and especially to mingle the marvellous, rather as a slight, delicate and evanescent flavour, than as any portion of the actual substance of the dish offered to the public. He can hardly be said, however, to commit a literary crime even if he disregard this caution. In the present work, the author has proposed to himself, but with what success, fortunately, it is not for him to judge, to keep undeviatingly within his immunities. The point of view in which this tale comes under the romantic definition lies in the attempt to connect a bygone time with the very present that is flitting away from us. It is a legend prolonging itself, from an epoch now grey in the distance, down into our own broad daylight, and bringing along with it some of its legendary mist, which the reader, according to his pleasure, may either disregard, or allow it to float almost imperceptibly about the characters and events for the sake of a picturesque effect. The narrative, it may be, is woven of so humble a texture as to require this advantage and at the same time to render it the more difficult of attainment. Many writers lay very great stress upon some definite moral purpose at which they profess to aim their works. Not to be deficient in this particular, the author has provided himself with a moral. The truth, namely, that the wrongdoing of one generation lives into the successive ones, and divesting itself of every temporary advantage becomes a pure and uncontrollable mischief, and he would feel it a singular gratification if this romance might effectually convince mankind, 
or indeed any one man, of the folly of tumbling down an avalanche of ill-gotten gold or real estate on the heads of an unfortunate posterity, thereby to maim and crush them, until the accumulated mass shall be scattered abroad in its original atoms. In good faith, however, he is not sufficiently imaginative to flatter himself with the slightest hope of this kind. When romances do really teach anything, or produce any effective operation, it is usually through a far more subtle process than the ostensible one. The author has considered it hardly worth his while, therefore, relentlessly, to impale the story with its moral as with an iron rod, or rather as by sticking a pin through a butterfly, thus at once depriving it of life and causing it to stiffen in an ungainly and unnatural attitude. A high truth indeed, fairly finely and skillfully wrought out, brightening at every step and crowning the final development of a work of fiction, may add an artistic glory, but is never any truer and seldom any more evident at the last page than at the first. The reader may perhaps choose to assign an actual locality to the imaginary events of this narrative. If permitted by the historical connection, which though slight was essential to his plan, the author would very willingly have avoided anything of this nature. Not to speak of other objections, it exposes the romance to an inflexible and exceedingly dangerous species of criticism by bringing his fancy pictures almost into positive contact with the realities of the moment. It has been no part of his object, however, to describe local manners, nor in any way to meddle with the characteristics of a community for whom he cherishes a proper respect and a natural regard. He trusts not to be considered as unpardonably offending by laying out a street that infringes upon nobody's private rights, and appropriating a lot of land which had no visible owner, and building a house of materials long in use for constructing castles in the air. The personages of the tale, though they give themselves out to be of ancient stability and considerable prominence, are really of the author's own making, or at all events of his own mixing. Their virtues can shed no luster nor their defects redound in the remotest degree to the discredit of the venerable town of which they profess to be inhabitants. He would be glad, therefore, if especially in the quarter to which he alludes, the book may be read strictly as a romance, having a great deal more to do with the clouds overhead than with any portion of the actual soil of the county of Essex. Lennox, January 27th, 1851. Chapter 1. The Old Pynchon Family Halfway down a by-street of one of our New England towns stands a rusty wooden house, with seven acutely peaked gables, facing towards various points of the compass, and a huge clustered chimney in the midst. The street is Pynchon Street, the house is the old Pynchon house, and an elm tree of wide circumference rooted before the door is familiar to every town-born child by the title of the Pynchon Elm. On my occasional visits to the town aforesaid, I seldom failed to turn down Pynchon Street, for the sake of passing through the shadow of these two antiquities, the great elm tree and the weather-beaten edifice. The aspect of the venerable mansion has always affected me like a human countenance bearing the traces not merely of outward storm and sunshine, but expressive also of the long lapse of mortal life and accompanying vicissitudes that have passed within. Were these to be worthily recounted, they would form a narrative of no small interest and instruction, and possessing, moreover, a certain remarkable unity, which might almost seem the result of artistic arrangement but the story would include a chain of events extending over the better part of two centuries, and, written out with reasonable amplitude, would fill a bigger folio volume or a longer series of duodecimos than could prudently be appropriated to the annals of all New England during a similar period. It consequently becomes imperative to make short work with most of the traditionary lore of which the old Pynchon House, otherwise known as the House of the Seven Gables, has been the theme. With a brief sketch, therefore, of the circumstances amid which the foundation of the house was laid, and a rapid glimpse at its quaint exterior, as it grew black in the prevalent east wind, pointing to here and there at some spot of more verdant mossiness on its roof and walls, we shall commence the real action of our tale at an epoch not very remote from the present day. Still, 
there will be a connection with the long past, a reference to forgotten events and personages, and to manners, feelings and opinions, almost or wholly obsolete, which, if adequately translated to the reader, would serve to illustrate how much of old material goes to make up the freshest novelty of human life. Hence, too, might be drawn a weighty lesson from the little-regarded truth, that the act of the passing generation is the germ which may and must produce good or evil fruit in a far distant time. That, together with the seed of the merely temporary crop, which mortals term expediency, they inevitably sow the acorns of a more enduring growth, which may darkly overshadow their posterity. The House of the Seven Gables, antique as it now looks, was not the first habitation erected by civilized man on precisely the same spot of ground. Pynchon Street formerly bore the humbler appellation of Mall's Lane, from the name of the original occupant of the soil, before whose cottage door it was a cow path. A natural spring of soft and pleasant water, a rare treasure on the Seagirt Peninsula where the Puritan settlement was made, had early induced Matthew Mall to build a hut, shaggy with thatch at this point, although somewhat too remote from what was then the centre of the village. In the growth of the town, however, after some 30 or 40 years, the site covered by this rude hovel had become exceedingly desirable in the eyes of a prominent and powerful personage, who asserted plausible claims to the proprietorship of this and a large adjacent tract of land, on the strength of a grant from the legislature. Colonel Pynchon, the claimant, as we gather from whatever traits of him are preserved, was characterized by an iron energy of purpose. Matthew Maul, on the other hand, though an obscure man, was stubborn in the defense of what he considered his right. And for several years, he succeeded in protecting the acre or two of earth which, with his own toil, he had hewn out of the primeval forest to be his garden ground and homestead. No written record of this dispute is known to be in existence. Our acquaintance with the whole subject is derived chiefly from tradition. It would be bold, therefore, and possibly unjust, to venture a decisive opinion as to its merits, although it appears to have been at least a matter of doubt whether Colonel Pynchon's claim were not unduly stretched, in order to make it cover the small meets and bounds of Matthew Moore. What greatly strengthens such a suspicion is the fact that this controversy between two ill-matched antagonists, at a period, moreover, lord it as we may, when personal influence had far more weight than now, remained for years undecided, and came to a close only with the death of the party occupying the disputed soil. The mode of his death, too, affects the mind differently in our day from what it did a century and a half ago. It was a death that blasted with strange horror the humble name of the dweller in the cottage and made it seem almost a religious act to drive the plough over the little area of his habitation and obliterate his place and memory from among men. Old Matthew Maul, in a word, was executed for the crime of witchcraft. He was one of the martyrs to that terrible delusion, which should teach us, among its other morals, that the influential classes and those who take upon themselves to be leaders of the people are fully liable to all the passionate error that has ever characterized the maddest mob. Clergymen, judges, statesmen, the wisest, calmest, holiest persons of their day stood in the inner circle round about the gallows, loudest to applaud the work of blood, latest to confess themselves miserably deceived. If any one part of their proceedings can be said to deserve less blame than another, it was the singular indiscrimination with which they persecuted, not merely the poor and aged as in former judicial massacres, but people of all ranks, their own equals, brethren, and wives. Amid the disorder of such various ruin, it is not strange that a man of inconsiderable note like Maul should have trodden the martyr's path to the hill of execution almost unremarked in the throng of his fellow sufferers. But in after days, when the frenzy of that hideous epoch had subsided, it was remembered how loudly Colonel Pynchon had joined in the general cry to purge the land from witchcraft. Nor did it fail to be whispered that there was an invidious acrimony in the zeal with which he had sought the condemnation of Matthew Moore. 
It was well known that the victim had recognized the bitterness of personal enmity in his persecutor's conduct towards him, and that he declared himself hunted to death for his spoil. At the moment of execution, with the halter about his neck, and while Colonel Pynchon sat on horseback, grimly gazing at the scene Maul had addressed him from the scaffold, and uttered a prophecy of which history, as well as fireside tradition, has preserved the very words. God, said the dying man, pointing his finger with a ghastly look at the undismayed countenance of his enemy. God will give him blood to drink. After the reputed wizard's death, his humble homestead had fallen an easy spoil into Colonel Pynchon's grasp. When it was understood, however, that the Colonel intended to erect a family mansion spacious, ponderously framed of oak and timber, and calculated to endure for many generations of his posterity over the spot first covered by the log-built hut of Matthew Maul, there was much shaking of the head among the village gossips. Without absolutely expressing a doubt whether the stalwart Puritan had acted as a man of conscience and integrity throughout the proceedings which have been sketched, they, nevertheless, hinted that he was about to build his house over an unquiet grave. His home would include the home of the dead and buried wizard, and would thus afford the ghost of the latter a kind of privilege to haunt its new apartments, and the chambers into which future bridegrooms were to lead their brides, and where children of the Pynchon blood were to be born. The terror and ugliness of Maul's crime, and the wretchedness of his punishment, would darken the freshly plastered walls, and infect them early with the scent of an old and melancholy house. Why then, while so much of the soil around him was bestrewn with the virgin forest leaves, why should Colonel Pynchon prefer a site that had already been accursed? But the Puritan soldier and magistrate was not a man to be turned aside from his well-considered scheme, either by dread of the wizard's ghost, or by flimsy sentimentalities of any kind, however specious. Had he been told of a bad air, it might have moved him somewhat but he was ready to encounter an evil spirit on his own ground. Endowed with common sense, as massive and hard as blocks of granite, fastened together by stern rigidity of purpose, as with iron clamps, he followed out his original design, probably without so much as imagining an objection to it. On the score of delicacy, or any scrupulousness which a finer sensibility might have taught him, the Colonel, like most of his breed and generation, was impenetrable. He therefore dug his cellar and laid the deep foundations of his mansion on the square of earth whence Matthew Maul, forty years before, had first swept away the fallen leaves. It was a curious, and as some people thought an ominous fact, that very soon after the workmen began their operations, the spring of water, above mentioned, entirely lost the deliciousness of its pristine quality. Whether its sources were disturbed by the depth of the new cellar, or whatever subtler cause might lurk at the bottom, it is certain that the water of Maul's well, as it continued to be called, grew hard and brackish. Even such we find it now, and any old woman of the neighbourhood will certify that it is productive of intestinal mischief to those who quench their thirst there. The reader may deem it singular that the head carpenter of the new edifice was no other than the son of the very man from whose dead gripe the property of the soil had been wrested. Not improbably he was the best workman of his time, or perhaps the colonel thought it expedient, or was impelled by some better feeling, thus openly to cast aside all animosity against the race of his fallen antagonist. Nor was it out of keeping with the general coarseness and matter-of-fact character of the age that the son should be willing to earn an honest penny, or rather, a weighty amount of sterling pounds, from the purse of his father's deadly enemy. At all events, Thomas Maul became the architect of the House of the Seven Gables, and performed his duties so faithfully that the timber framework fastened by his hands still holds together. Thus the great house was built. Familiar as it stands in the writer's recollection, for it has been an object of curiosity with him from boyhood, both as a specimen of the best and stateliest architecture of a long past epoch, and as the scene of events more full of human interest, perhaps, than those of a grey feudal castle. Familiar as it stands, 
in its rusty old age, it is therefore only the more difficult to imagine the bright novelty with which it first caught the sunshine. The impression of its actual state, at this distance of 160 years, darkens inevitably through the picture which we would fain give of its appearance on the morning when the Puritan magnet bade all the town to be his guests. A ceremony of consecration, festive as well as religious, was now to be performed. A prayer and discourse from the Reverend Mr. Higginson, and the outpouring of a psalm from the general throat of the community, was to be made acceptable to the grosser sense by ale, cider, wine and brandy, in copious effusion, and, as some authorities aver, by an ox, roasted whole, or at least by the weight and substance of an ox, in more manageable joints and sirloins. The carcass of a deer shot within twenty miles had supplied material for the vast circumference of a pasty. A codfish of sixty pounds caught in the bay had been dissolved into the rich liquid of a chowder. The chimney of the new house, in short, belching forth its kitchen smoke, impregnated the whole air with the scent of meats, fowls and fishes, spicily concocted with odoriferous herbs and onions in abundance. The mere smell of such festivity, making its way to everybody's nostrils, was at once an invitation and an appetite. Mall's Lane, or Pynchon Street, as it were now more decorous to call it, was thronged at the appointed hour as with a congregation on its way to church. All, as they approached, looked upward at the imposing edifice, which was henceforth to assume its rank among the habitations of mankind. There it rose, a little withdrawn from the line of the street, but in pride, not modesty. Its whole visible exterior was ornamented with quaint figures, conceived in the grotesqueness of a Gothic fancy, and drawn or stamped in the glittering plaster, composed of lime, pebbles and bits of glass, with which the woodwork of the walls was overspread. On every side the seven gables pointed sharply towards the sky, and presented the aspect of a whole sisterhood of edifices, breathing through the spiracles of one great chimney. The many lattices, with their small diamond-shaped panes, admitted the sunlight into hall and chamber, while nevertheless, the second story projecting far over the base and itself retiring beneath the third, threw a shadowy and thoughtful gloom into the lower rooms. Carved globes of wood were affixed under the jutting stories. Little spiral rods of iron beautified each of the seven peaks. On the triangular portion of the gable that fronted next the street was a dial put up that very morning and on which the sun was still marking the passage of the first bright hour in a history that was not destined to be all so bright. All around were scattered shavings, chips, shingles and broken halves of bricks. These, together with the lately turned earth, on which the grass had not begun to grow, contributed to the impression of strangeness and novelty proper to a house that had yet its place to make among men's daily interests. The principal entrance, which had almost the breadth of a church door, was in the angle between the two front gables and was covered by an open porch with benches beneath its shelter. Under this arched doorway, scraping their feet on the unworn threshold, now trod the clergymen, the elders, the magistrates, the deacons, and whatever of aristocracy there was in town or county. Thither too thronged the plebeian classes as freely as their betters and in larger number. Just within the entrance, however, stood two serving men, pointing some of the guests to the neighborhood of the kitchen and ushering others into the statelier rooms. Hospitable alike to all, but still with a scrutinizing regard to the high or low degree of each. Velvet garments somber but rich, stiffly plaited ruffs and bands, embroidered gloves, venerable beards, the mien and countenance of authority, made it easy to distinguish the gentleman of worship at that period from the tradesman with his plodding air, or the labourer in his leathern jerkin, stealing awe-stricken into the house which he had perhaps helped to build. One inauspicious circumstance there was, which awakened a hardly concealed displeasure in the breasts of a few of the more punctilious visitors. The founder of this stately mansion, a gentleman noted for the square and ponderous courtesy of his demeanour, ought surely to have stood in his own hall, and to have offered the first welcome to so many eminent personages as here presented themselves in honour of his solemn festival. 
He was as yet invisible. The most favoured of the guests had not beheld him. This sluggishness on Colonel Pynchon's part became still more unaccountable when the second dignitary of the province made his appearance and found no more ceremonious a reception. The Lieutenant Governor, although his visit was one of the anticipated glories of the day, had alighted from his horse and assisted his lady from her side saddle and crossed the Colonel's threshold without other greeting than that of the principal domestic. This person, a grey-headed man of quiet and most respectful deportment, found it necessary to explain that his master still remained in his study or private apartment, on entering which an hour before he had expressed a wish on no account to be disturbed. Do not you see, fellow, said the high sheriff of the county, taking the servant aside, that this is no less a man than the lieutenant governor? Summon Colonel Pynchon at once. I know that he received letters from England this morning, and in the perusal and consideration of them, an hour may have passed away without his noticing it. But he will be ill-pleased, I judge, if you suffer him to neglect the courtesy due to one of our chief rulers, and who may be said to represent King William in the absence of the governor himself. Call your master instantly. Nay, please your worship, answered the man in much perplexity but with a backwardness that strikingly indicated the hard and severe character of Colonel Pynchon's domestic rule. My master's orders were exceeding strict, and as your worship knows, he permits of no discretion in the obedience of those who owe him service. Let who list open yonder door, I dare not, though the governor's own voice should bid me do it. Pooh, pooh, Master High Sheriff, cried the Lieutenant Governor, who had overheard the foregoing discussion and felt himself high enough in station to play a little with his dignity. I will take the matter into my own hands. It is time that the good Colonel came forth to greet his friends, else we shall be apt to suspect that he has taken a sip too much of his canary wine, in his extreme deliberation which casket were best to broach in honour of the day. But since he is so much behindhand, I will give him a remembrancer myself. Accordingly, with such a tramp of his ponderous riding boots as might of itself have been audible in the remotest of the seven gables, he advanced to the door, which the servant pointed out, and made its new panels re-echo with a loud free knock. Then, looking round with a smile to the spectators, he awaited a response. As none came, however, he knocked again, but with the same unsatisfactory result as at first. And now, being a trifle choleric in his temperament, the Lieutenant Governor uplifted the heavy hilt of his sword, wherewith he so beat and banged upon the door, that as some of the bystanders whispered, the racket might have disturbed the dead. Be that as it might, it seemed to produce no awakening effect on Colonel Pynchon. When the sound subsided, the silence through the house was deep, dreary and oppressive, notwithstanding that the tongues of many of the guests had already been loosened by a surreptitious cup or two of wine or spirits. Strange, forsooth, very strange, cried the Lieutenant Governor, whose smile was changed to a frown. But seeing that our host sets us the good example of forgetting ceremony, I shall likewise throw it aside and make free to intrude on his privacy. He tried the door which yielded to his hand and was flung wide open by a sudden gust of wind that passed, as with a loud sigh, from the outermost portal through all the passages and apartments of the new house. It rustled the silken garments of the ladies and waved the long curls of the gentlemen's wigs and shook the window hangings and the curtains of the bedchambers, causing everywhere a singular stir, which yet was more like a hush. A shadow of awe and half-fearful anticipation, nobody knew wherefore, nor of what, had all at once fallen over the company. They thronged, however, to the now open door, pressing the Lieutenant Governor, in the eagerness of their curiosity, into the room in advance of them. At the first glimpse, they beheld nothing extraordinary. A handsomely furnished room of moderate size, somewhat darkened by curtains, books arranged on shelves, a large map on the wall, and likewise a portrait of Colonel Pynchon, beneath which sat the original Colonel himself, in an oaken elbow chair with a pen in his hand. Letters, parchments and blank sheets of paper were on the table before him. He appeared to gaze at the curious crowd in front of which stood the Lieutenant Governor, 
and there was a frown on his dark and massive countenance, as if sternly resentful of the boldness that had impelled them into his private retirement. A little boy, the colonel's grandchild, and the only human being that ever dared to be familiar with him, now made his way among the guests and ran towards the seated figure. Then pausing halfway, he began to shriek with terror. The company, tremulous as the leaves of a tree, when all are shaking together, drew nearer and perceived that there was an unnatural distortion in the fixedness of Colonel Pynchon's stare, that there was blood on his ruff and that his hoary beard was saturated with it. It was too late to give assistance. The iron-hearted Puritan, the relentless persecutor, the grasping and strong-willed man was dead, dead in his new house. There is a tradition only worth alluding to as lending a tinge of superstitious awe to a scene perhaps gloomy enough without it, that a voice spoke loudly among the guests, the tones of which were like those of old Matthew Moore, the executed wizard. God hath given him blood to drink. Thus early had that one guest, the only guest who is certain at one time or another to find his way into every human dwelling. Thus early had death stepped across the threshold of the House of the Seven Gables. Colonel Pynchon's sudden and mysterious end made a vast deal of noise in its day. There were many rumours, some of which have vaguely drifted down to the present time, how that appearances indicated violence, that there were the marks of fingers on his throat and the print of a bloody hand on his plaited ruff, and that his peaked beard was dishevelled as if it had been fiercely clutched and pulled. It was averred, likewise, that the lattice window near the colonel's chair was open, and that, only a few minutes before the fatal occurrence, the figure of a man had been seen clambering over the garden fence in the rear of the house. But it were folly to lay any stress on stories of this kind, which are sure to spring up around such an event as that now related, and which, as in the present case, sometimes prolong themselves for ages afterwards, like the toadstools that indicate where the fallen and buried trunk of a tree has long since moulded into the earth. For our own part, we allow them just as little credence as to that other fable of the skeleton hand which the Lieutenant Governor was said to have seen at the Colonel's throat, but which vanished away as he advanced farther into the room. Certain it is, however, that there was a great consultation and dispute of doctors over the dead body. One, John Swinnerton by name, who appears to have been a man of eminence, upheld it, if we have rightly understood his terms of art, to be a case of apoplexy. His professional brethren, each for himself, adopted various hypotheses, more or less plausible, but all dressed out in a perplexing mystery of phrase, which, if it do not show a bewilderment of mind in these erudite physicians, certainly causes it in the unlearned peruser of their opinions. The coroner's jury sat upon the corpse, and like sensible men, returned an unassailable verdict of sudden death. It is indeed difficult to imagine that there could have been a serious suspicion of murder, or the slightest grounds for implicating any particular individual as the perpetrator. The rank, wealth, and eminent character of the deceased must have ensured the strictest scrutiny into every ambiguous circumstance. As none such is on record, it is safe to assume that none existed tradition, which sometimes brings down truth that history has let slip, but is oftener the wild babble of the time, such as was formerly spoken at the fireside and now congeals in newspapers. Tradition is responsible for all contrary averments, in Colonel Pynchon's funeral sermon, which was printed and is still extant, the Reverend Mr. Higginson enumerates among the many felicities of his distinguished parishioner's earthly career, the happy seasonableness of his death, his duties all performed, the highest prosperity attained, his race and future generations fixed on a stable basis and with a stately roof to shelter them for centuries to come. What other upward step remained for this good man to take, save the final step from earth to the golden gate of heaven? The pious clergyman surely would not have uttered words like these, had he in the least suspected that the colonel had been thrust into the other world with the clutch of violence upon his throat. The family of Colonel Pynchon, 
at the epoch of his death, seemed destined to as fortunate a permanence as can anywise consist with the inherent instability of human affairs. It might fairly be anticipated that the progress of time would rather increase and ripen their prosperity than wear away and destroy it. For not only had his son and heir come into immediate enjoyment of a rich estate, but there was a claim through an Indian deed, confirmed by a subsequent grant of the general court, to a vast and as yet unexplored and unmeasured tract of eastern lands. These possessions, for as such they might almost certainly be reckoned, comprise the greater part of what is now known as Waldo County, in the state of Maine, and were more extensive than many a dukedom, or even a reigning prince's territory, on European soil. When the pathless forest that still covered this wild principality should give place, as it inevitably must, though perhaps not till ages hence, to the golden fertility of human culture, it would be the source of incalculable wealth to the Pynchon blood. Had the Colonel survived only a few weeks longer, it is probable that his great political influence and powerful connections at home and abroad would have consummated all that was necessary to render the claim available. But in spite of good Mr. Higginson's congratulatory eloquence, this appeared to be the one thing which Colonel Pynchon, provident and sagacious as he was, had allowed to go at loose ends. So far as the prospective territory was concerned, he unquestionably died too soon. His son lacked not merely the father's eminent position, but the talent and force of character to achieve it. He could, therefore, effect nothing by dint of political interest, and the bare justice or legality of the claim was not so apparent after the Colonel's decease as it had been pronounced in his lifetime. Some connecting link had slipped out of the evidence and could not anywhere be found. Efforts, it is true, were made by the Pynchons, not only then, but at various periods for nearly a hundred years afterwards, to obtain what they stubbornly persisted in deeming their right. But in course of time, the territory was partly regranted to more favoured individuals and partly cleared and occupied by actual settlers. These last, if they ever heard of the Pynchon title, would have laughed at the idea of any man's asserting a right, on the strength of mouldy parchments, signed with the faded autographs of governors and legislators long dead and forgotten, to the lands which they or their fathers had wrested from the wild hand of nature by their own sturdy toil. This impalpable claim therefore resulted in nothing more solid than to cherish, from generation to generation, an absurd delusion of family importance which all along characterized the Pynchons. It caused the poorest member of the race to feel as if he inherited a kind of nobility and might yet come into the possession of princely wealth to support it. In the better specimens of the breed, this peculiarity threw an ideal grace over the hard material of human life, without stealing away any truly valuable quality. In the baser sort, its effect was to increase the liability to sluggishness and dependence, and induce the victim of a shadowy hope to remit all self-effort while awaiting the realization of his dreams. Years and years after their claim had passed out of the public memory, the Pynchons were accustomed to consult the Colonel's ancient map, which had been projected while Waldo County was still an unbroken wilderness. Where the old land surveyor had put down woods, lakes, and rivers, they marked out the cleared spaces and dotted the villages and towns, and calculated the progressively increasing value of the territory, as if there were yet a prospect of its ultimately forming a princedom for themselves. In almost every generation, nevertheless, there happened to be some one descendant of the family gifted with a portion of the hard, keen sense and practical energy that had so remarkably distinguished the original founder. His character indeed might be traced all the way down, as distinctly as if the Colonel himself, a little diluted, had been gifted with a sort of intermittent immortality on Earth. At two or three epochs, when the fortunes of the family were low, this representative of hereditary qualities had made his appearance and caused the traditionary gossips of the town to whisper among themselves, Here is the old Pynchon come again. Now the Seven Gables will be new shingled. From father to son, 
they clung to the ancestral house with singular tenacity of home attachment. For various reasons, however, and from impressions often too vaguely founded to be put on paper, the writer cherishes the belief that many, if not most, of the successive proprietors of this estate were troubled with doubts as to their moral right to hold it. Of their legal tenure there could be no question, but old Matthew Maul, it is to be feared, trode downward from his own age to a far later one, planting a heavy footstep all the way on the conscience of a pension. If so, we are left to dispose of the awful query, whether each inheritor of the property conscious of wrong and failing to rectify it, did not commit anew the great guilt of his ancestor and incur all its original responsibilities. And supposing such to be the case, would it not be a far truer mode of expression to say of the Pynchon family that they inherited a great misfortune than the reverse? We have already hinted that it is not our purpose to trace down the history of the Pynchon family in its unbroken connection with the House of the Seven Gables, nor to show, as in a magic picture, how the rustiness and infirmity of age gathered over the venerable house itself. As regards its interior life, a large, dim-looking glass used to hang in one of the rooms, and was fabled to contain within its depths all the shapes that had ever been reflected there. The old colonel himself and his many descendants, some in the garb of antique babyhood, and others in the bloom of feminine beauty or manly prime, or saddened with the wrinkles of frosty age. Had we the secret of that mirror, we would gladly sit down before it and transfer its revelations to our page. But there was a story, for which it is difficult to conceive any foundation, that the posterity of Matthew Moore had some connection with the mystery of the looking glass, and that, by what appears to have been a sort of mesmeric process, they could make its inner region all alive with the departed pinchons, not as they had shown themselves to the world, nor in their better and happier hours, but as doing over again some deed of sin, or in the crisis of life's bitterest sorrow. The popular imagination, indeed, long kept itself busy with the affair of the old Puritan Pynchon and the Wizard Moor. The curse which the latter flung from his scaffold was remembered with the very important addition that it had become a part of the Pynchon inheritance. If one of the family did but gurgle in his throat, a bystander would be likely enough to whisper between jest and earnest, he has Maul's blood to drink. The sudden death of a pension about a hundred years ago, with circumstances very similar to what had been related of the Colonel's exit, was held as giving additional probability to the received opinion on this topic. It was considered, moreover, an ugly and ominous circumstance that Colonel Pynchon's picture, in obedience, it was said, to a provision of his will, remained affixed to the wall of the room in which he died. Those stern, immitigable features seemed to symbolize an evil influence, and so darkly to mingle the shadow of their presence with the sunshine of the passing hour, that no good thoughts or purposes could ever spring up and blossom there. To the thoughtful mind, there will be no tinge of superstition in what we figuratively express, by affirming that the ghost of a dead progenitor, perhaps as a portion of his own punishment, is often doomed to become the evil genius of his family. The Pynchons, in brief, lived along for the better part of two centuries, with perhaps less of outward vicissitude than has attended most other New England families during the same period of time. Possessing very distinctive traits of their own, they nevertheless took the general characteristics of the little community in which they dwelt. A town noted for its frugal, discreet, well-ordered and home-loving inhabitants, as well as for the somewhat confined scope of its sympathies. But in which, be it said, there are odder individuals and now and then stranger occurrences than one meets with almost anywhere else. During the revolution, the pension of that epoch, adopting the royal side, became a refugee, but repented and made his reappearance, just at the point of time to preserve the House of the Seven Gables from confiscation. For the last 70 years, the most noted event in the pension annals had been likewise the heaviest calamity that ever befell the race. No less than the violent death 
for so it was adjudged, of one member of the family by the criminal act of another. Certain circumstances attending this fatal occurrence had brought the deed irresistibly home to a nephew of the deceased Pynchon. The young man was tried and convicted of the crime, but either the circumstantial nature of the evidence, and possibly some lurking doubts in the breast of the executive, or, lastly, an argument of greater weight in a republic than it could have been under a monarchy, the high respectability and political influence of the criminal's connections had availed to mitigate his doom from death to perpetual imprisonment. This sad affair had chanced about 30 years before the action of our story commences. Latterly, there were rumours, which few believed and only one or two felt greatly interested in, that this long-buried man was likely, for some reason or other, to be summoned forth from his living tomb. It is essential to say a few words respecting the victim of this now almost forgotten murder. He was an old bachelor and possessed of great wealth. In addition to the house and real estate which constituted what remained of the ancient Pynchon property, being of an eccentric and melancholy turn of mind, and greatly given to rummaging old records and hearkening to old traditions, he had brought himself, it is averred, to the conclusion that Matthew Moore, the wizard, had been foully wronged out of his homestead, if not out of his life. Such being the case, and he, the old bachelor, in possession of the ill-gotten spoil, with the black stain of blood sunken deep into it, and still to be scented by conscientious nostrils, the question occurred whether it were not imperative upon him, even at this late hour, to make restitution to Maul's posterity. To a man living so much in the past and so little in the present, as the secluded and antiquarian old bachelor, a century and a half seemed not so vast a period as to obviate the propriety of substituting right for wrong. It was the belief of those who knew him best that he would positively have taken the very singular step of giving up the House of the Seven Gables to the representative of Matthew Maul. But for the unspeakable tumult which a suspicion of the old gentleman's project awakened among his Pynchon relatives, their exertions had the effect of suspending his purpose, but it was feared that he would perform, after death, by the operation of his last will, what he had so hardly been prevented from doing in his proper lifetime. But there is no one thing which men so rarely do, whatever the provocation or inducement, as to bequeath patrimonial property away from their own blood. They may love other individuals far better than their relatives. They may even cherish dislike or positive hatred to the latter. But yet, in view of death, the strong prejudice of propinquity revives and impels the testator to send down his estate in the line marked out by custom so immemorial that it looks like nature. In all the pensions, this feeling had the energy of disease. It was too powerful for the conscientious scruples of the old bachelor, at whose death, accordingly, the mansion house, together with most of his other riches, passed into the possession of his next legal representative. This was a nephew, the cousin of the miserable young man who had been convicted of the uncle's murder. The new heir, up to the period of his accession, was reckoned rather a dissipated youth, but had at once reformed and made himself an exceedingly respectable member of society. In fact, he showed more of the pension quality and had won higher eminence in the world than any of his race since the time of the original Puritan. Applying himself in earlier manhood to the study of the law and having a natural tendency towards office, he had attained many years ago to a judicial situation in some inferior court, which gave him for life the very desirable and imposing title of judge. Later, he had engaged in politics and served a part of two terms in Congress, besides making a considerable figure in both branches of the state legislature. Judge Pynchon was unquestionably an honor to his race. He had built himself a country seat within a few miles of his native town, and there spent such portions of his time as could be spared from public service in the display of every grace and virtue. As a newspaper phrased it on the eve of an election, befitting the Christian, the good citizen, the horticulturist, and the gentleman. There were few of the pensions left to sun themselves in the glow of the judge's prosperity. In respect to natural increase, the breed had not thriven. 
it appeared rather to be dying out. The only members of the family known to be extant were first the judge himself and a single surviving son who was now traveling in Europe. Next, the 30 years prisoner already alluded to and a sister of the latter who occupied in an extremely retired manner the house of the Seven Gables in which she had a life estate by the will of the old bachelor. She was understood to be wretchedly poor and seemed to make it her choice to remain so, inasmuch as her affluent cousin, the judge, had repeatedly offered her all the comforts of life, either in the old mansion or his own modern residence. The last and youngest Pynchon was a little country girl of 17, the daughter of another of the judge's cousins, who had married a young woman of no family or property and died early and in poor circumstances. His widow had recently taken another husband. As for Matthew Maul's posterity, it was supposed now to be extinct. For a very long period after the witchcraft delusion, however, the Mauls had continued to inhabit the town where their progenitor had suffered so unjust a death. To all appearance, they were a quiet, honest, well-meaning race of people, cherishing no malice against individuals or the public for the wrong which had been done them. Or if, at their own fireside, they transmitted from father to child any hostile recollection of the wizard's fate and their lost patrimony, it was never acted upon, nor openly expressed. Nor would it have been singular had they ceased to remember that the House of the Seven Gables was resting its heavy framework on a foundation that was rightfully their own. There is something so massive, stable, and almost irresistibly imposing in the exterior presentment of established rank and great possessions that their very existence seems to give them a right to exist. At least so excellent a counterfeit of right that few poor and humble men have moral force enough to question it, even in their secret minds. Such is the case now, after so many ancient prejudices have been overthrown. And it was far more so in anti-revolutionary days, when the aristocracy could venture to be proud and the low were content to be abased. Thus, the Mauls, at all events, kept their resentments within their own breasts. They were generally poverty-stricken, always plebeian and obscure, working with unsuccessful diligence at handicrafts, laboring on the wharves or following the sea as sailors before the mast living here and there about the town in hired tenements and coming finally to the almshouse as the natural home of their old age. At last, after creeping as it were for such a length of time along the utmost verge of the opaque puddle of obscurity, they had taken that downright plunge which sooner or later is the destiny of all families, whether princely or plebeian. For thirty years past, neither town record nor gravestone nor the directory nor the knowledge or memory of man bore any trace of Matthew Maul's descendants. His blood might possibly exist elsewhere, here where its lowly current could be traced so far back it had ceased to keep an onward course. So long as any of the race were to be found, they had been marked out from other men, not strikingly, nor as with a sharp line, but with an effect that was felt rather than spoken of, by an hereditary character of reserve. Their companions, or those who endeavoured to become such, grew conscious of a circle round about the malls, within the sanctity or the spell of which, in spite of an exterior of sufficient frankness and good fellowship, it was impossible for any man to step. It was this indefinable peculiarity, perhaps, that by insulating them from human aid, kept them always so unfortunate in life. It certainly operated to prolong in their case and to confirm to them as their only inheritance those feelings of repugnance and superstitious terror with which the people of the town, even after awakening from their frenzy, continued to regard the memory of the reputed witches. The mantle, or rather the ragged cloak, of old Matthew Maul had fallen upon his children. They were half believed to inherit mysterious attributes the family eye was said to possess strange power. Among other good-for-nothing properties and privileges, one was especially assigned them, that of exercising an influence over people's dreams. 
the Pynchons, if all stories were true, haughtily as they bore themselves in the noonday streets of their native town, were no better than bond servants to these plebeian malls, on entering the topsy-turvy commonwealth of sleep. Modern psychology, it may be, will endeavour to reduce these alleged necromancies within a system, instead of rejecting them as altogether fabulous. A descriptive paragraph or two, treating of the Seven Gabled Mansion in its more recent aspect, will bring this preliminary chapter to a close. The street in which it upreared its venerable peaks has long ceased to be a fashionable quarter of the town, so that, though the old edifice was surrounded by habitations of modern date, they were mostly small, built entirely of wood, and typical of the most plodding uniformity of common life. Doubtless, however, the whole story of human existence may be latent in each of them, but with no picturesqueness, externally, that can attract the imagination or sympathy to seek it there. But as for the old structure of our story, its white oak frame and its boards, shingles and crumbling plaster, and even the huge clustered chimney in the midst, seem to constitute only the least and meanest part of its reality. So much of mankind's varied experience had passed there, so much had been suffered, and something too enjoyed, that the very timbers were oozy, as with the moisture of a heart. It was itself like a great human heart, with a life of its own, and full of rich and sombre reminiscences. The deep projection of the second story gave the house such a meditative look, that you could not pass it without the idea that it had secrets to keep, and an eventful history to moralize upon. In front, just on the edge of the unpaved sidewalk grew the Pynchon Elm, which, in reference to such trees as one usually meets with, might well be termed gigantic. It had been planted by a great-grandson of the first Pynchon, and though now fourscore years of age, or perhaps nearer a hundred, was still in its strong and broad maturity, throwing its shadow from side to side of the street, overtopping the seven gables and sweeping the whole black roof with its pendant foliage. It gave beauty to the old edifice, and seemed to make it a part of nature. The street having been widened about 40 years ago, the front gable was now precisely on a line with it. On either side extended a ruinous wooden fence of open latticework, through which could be seen a grassy yard, and especially in the angles of the building, an enormous fertility of burdocks with leaves. It is hardly an exaggeration to say two or three feet long. Behind the house there appeared to be a garden, which undoubtedly had once been extensive, but was now infringed upon by other enclosures, or shut in by habitations and outbuildings that stood on another street. It would be an omission, trifling indeed, but unpardonable, were we to forget the green moss that had long since gathered over the projections of the windows and on the slopes of the roof, nor must we fail to direct the reader's eye to a crop, not of weeds but flower shrubs, which were growing aloft in the air, not a great way from the chimney, in the nook between two of the gables. They were called Alice's Posies. The tradition was that a certain Alice Pynchon had flung up the seeds in sport, and that the dust of the street and the decay of the roof gradually formed a kind of soil for them, out of which they grew, when Alice had long been in her grave. However the flowers might have come there, it was both sad and sweet to observe how nature adopted to herself this desolate, decaying, gusty, rusty old house of the Pynchon family, and how the even returning summer did her best to gladden it with tender beauty and grew melancholy in the effort. There is one other feature, very essential to be noticed, but which we greatly fear may damage any picturesque and romantic impression which we have been willing to throw over our sketch of this respectable edifice. In the front gable, under the impending brow of the second story, and contiguous to the street, was a shop door, divided horizontally in the midst, and with a window for its upper segment, such as is often seen in dwellings of a somewhat ancient date. This same shop door had been a subject of no slight mortification to the present occupant of the August Pynchon House, as well as to some of her predecessors. The matter is disagreeably delicate to handle, but since the reader must needs be let into the secret, he will please to understand that about a century ago, the head of the Pynchons found himself involved in serious financial difficulties. 
The fellow, gentleman, as he styled himself, can hardly have been other than a spurious interloper, for, instead of seeking office from the king or the royal governor, or urging his hereditary claim to eastern lands, he bethought himself of no better avenue to wealth than by cutting a shop door through the side of his ancestral residence. It was the custom of the time, indeed, for merchants to store their goods and transact business in their own dwellings. But there was something pitifully small in this old Pynchon's mode of setting about his commercial operations. It was whispered that, with his own hands, all beruffled as they were, he used to give change for a shilling, and would turn a halfpenny twice over to make sure that it was a good one. Beyond all question, he had the blood of a petty huckster in his veins, through whatever channel it may have found its way there. Immediately on his death, the shop door had been locked, bolted and barred, and down to the period of our story, had probably never once been opened. The old counter, shelves and other fixtures of the little shop remained just as he had left them. It used to be affirmed that the dead shopkeeper, in a white wig, a faded velvet coat, an apron at his waist, and his ruffles carefully turned back from his wrists, might be seen through the chinks of the shutters, any night of the year, ransacking his till, or poring over the dingy pages of his day book. From the look of unutterable woe upon his face, it appeared to be his doom to spend eternity in a vain effort to make his accounts balance. And now, in a very humble way, as will be seen, we proceed to open our narrative. The mysterious death of Colonel Pynchon sets the stage for a series of confusing and mysterious events. Hepzibah and Clifford, filled with grief and fear, are uncertain of what the future holds. The arrival of Phoebe Pynchon brings a ray of hope to the gloomy house. Her cheerful and optimistic presence brings positive changes to Hepzibah and Clifford. Meanwhile, Holgrave, the mysterious lodger, begins to show an interest in Phoebe. His past remains a mystery, and it seems to be connected to the Pynchon family. Chapter 1 ends with lingering questions. What really happened to Colonel Pynchon? What does Matthew Maul's curse mean? And what does the future hold for Hepzibah, Clifford and Phoebe in the House of the Seven Gables? These questions will be answered in the next chapter. Thank you for listening to Chapter 1 of The House of the Seven Gables. See you in Chapter 2.